Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Building a Culture of Trauma-Informed Practice to Serve All Tribal TANF Families. We are, of course, delighted to have a wonderful lineup of expert presenters to discuss this topic with you today. I'm James Butler, and I serve as one of the Family Assistance Program Specialists in the Office of Family Assistance within the Administration for Children and Families. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our objectives um, for today's call, and then we'll give you a brief tour of the webinar platform before um, we hand it off to today's speakers. Um, it's our hope that today's webinar will help equip our frontline TANF staff with some trauma-informed practices and communication strategies to use during client caseworker interactions. Um, this may include promoting transparency and participant choice, empowering participants to take an active role in the decision-making process, and ensuring participant safety as being key to every interaction. That you leave this webinar with a better understanding of how to build your program's capacity for responding to trauma experienced by your participants and prevent to the best of your ability, having them go through that same trauma again. Um, our presenters will share their expertise with you. And then we've carved out some time uh, for Q&A towards the end of the webinar. Um, just as a note for everyone to, at the very beginning, this webinar is being recorded and we will be posting all the slides and recording of today's session um, on our PRTA website in a few days so that you may access the resources later. What I'd like to do now is turn things over to Steve McLean of BLH, who's gonna provide you with a brief tech run through and start us off with a couple of polls. Steve. Thanks, James. Uh, just really quickly, we wanted to let folks know how to submit questions. We are definitely hoping for an interactive webinar session um, so you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A icon. You can click on that at any point to submit a question and it will be submitted to the presenters and answered during the Q&A session. Um, if you get excited and put a question in the chat box, we won't hold that against you. We will answer those also. Uh, there will be a few polls during the webinar, as James mentioned and you can respond directly on screen to answer those. Just click on the radio button next to your preferred answer. Um, next slide, please, Susanna. We hope you will hang on at the end of the webinar. There will be a quick survey. I promise that it's short. Uh, five questions. We just want to get your input on the webinar. Uh, to help us guide future webinars. So we would appreciate your feedback there. Uh, there will also be a link to the survey in the chat box as well. Uh, so you can either click onto the link or you click continue on your screen and you will arrive at the survey. Uh, and as always, if you need any assistance throughout the webinar, just shoot us a chat and we will do our best to help you out. Okay, uh, next slide. Let's go to the first poll, which is, which of the following best describes your organization? So we want to learn a little bit about the folks who are here today. Are you from a tribal TANF program, a state TANF program, family or social service program? Are you federal government staff uh, or other? the infamous other. And if you are one of the others, feel free to provide additional information in the chat box. We'll give you a couple more seconds to respond to that. And let's see what we have here. Ah, okay. So the majority of you are from the Tribal TANF program. Um, I'm certain we may have some of our uh, Native Employment Works partners here as well, uh, but good representation from some other folks 
which is also good. Always glad to have all of you. Okay, next poll. That went so well. Let's do one more. Uh, let's see. Second poll. To what extent does your tribal TANF program already incorporate trauma-informed practices? So this is a little bit about your current status going into the webinar. Uh, and your selections are, we have programs targeted specifically at addressing trauma in our community. We have programs that have a broad target audience. We are exploring our options and in the works of creating programs to address trauma, or we are here to learn more. Any of these answers are fine. Uh, so let's see what the second poll has to offer. Okay, there we go. Um, again, you already have programs targeted specifically at addressing trauma, programs with a broad target audience. Uh, you're just exploring your options and in the works, or you are here to learn more. All right. Thanks folks, thanks for your input, we appreciate it. Let's move on to our first presenter. And I will turn over the mic. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you, the Office of Family Assistance for having uh, me here today. Um, I, uh, I'll introduce myself in just a second, but today I'm going to be the introduction presentation talking a bit about colonization, historical trauma, and Indigenous culture as a protective factor. We can go to the next slide. Um, you'll also see a variety of different uh, Native art pictures that I wanted to share um, with the slides as well. So I'm going to start with, I've talked to the the two other presenters I'm presenting with today, and I'm going to be opening with the land acknowledgement for all three of our locations. So uh, we recognize that people are calling in from many, many different places today. So if you don't know whose land you are on, I have the native-land.ca um, link, and you can go zoom way into that map and see where you are, or you can even just text uh, your city and state to the, to the number on the slide there. Um, so I wanna start with um, a land acknowledgement uh, using a connectedness approach that uh, my friend, Dr. Jessica Samuel Ulrich, also a citizen of the Nome Eskimo community like myself, um, has shared. So this begins with us getting grounded and connected to the land we are on. If you have a window that you can look out of, connect with what you see or what you hear. If you don't have a window, feel the ground beneath your feet. Take a deep breath in and feel gratitude for everything that the earth provides so that we can live a good life. The air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food that we eat, as well as the warmth from the sun that sustains us. Feel this support as we further our learning today. So now as you look outside the window or as you connect to the earth, um, let us feel this connection and gratitude for uh, the original uh, people of these lands. Um, I am in, located right now in Arlington, Virginia. These are the tr traditional lands of the Piscataway and Anacostan people. That's in the whole really um, DMV, DC area. Uh, the presenter after me, Andrea, lives near the Raritan River which sits on the lands of the traditional Lenni Lenape people. And our last presenter today is Crystal, who lives in Juneau on Shinke Ami, which is on the traditional lands of the Aquaquan, 
and Takakwan. So we recognize that many indigenous people have had their land taken and also have been removed from their traditional lands. We are taking this time to honor their traditions, their elders, their living culture, and give our respect to all those people in a relational way that we have with the lands and the generations of people. We also recognize colonization, genocide, and historical trauma continue to be experienced today. And we acknowledge the re resilience of indigenous peoples to survive through mass genocide as we have over the years. Um, we wanna acknowledge that we know this is only a beginning to make a land acknowledgement and that true decolonization, recognition of tribal sovereignty and the land back movement are, are vital to our well-being. Next slide, please. So I'll introduce myself briefly in my language. Pagwagifsi, Atiga Hader Soyak, Jane Gordon, and Nupiak Siniga Soyak, Homer Alaskami, Akaga, Ku Elizabeth Gordon, Apaga, William Lewis Strutt. So welcome. My name is Hader Soyak, Jean Gordon Soyak is my Anupiak name, uh, which means drum. I think of myself as keeping that heartbeat of the drum going. Um, I am originally from Homer, Alaska. My mother is Sue Elizabeth Gordon and my father is William Lewis Strutz. I currently am a research scientist at Child Trends. We are a nonprofit organization working for the well being of children, youth, and families. Um, I have a lot of experience working in the Arctic, um, in Alaska, and in Greenland, um, and working around self determination and well being and, and indigenous knowledge. I was born and raised on my grandmother's reindeer ranch, um, learning the new values from my grandmother. Next slide, please. So I just wanna start with a brief introduction to who indigenous peoples are in the US and territories. Um, indigenous peoples we have in the contiguous 48 states uh, are typically referred to as American Indian, which is of course a overarching umbrella term that is representing over 200 different unique tribal peoples. Um, in Alaska, we have Alaska Natives, again, over 200 tribal peoples there. In Hawaii, we have Native Hawaiians, and in Guam, American and Samoa, and the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, these people are often called other Pacific Islanders. These are US territories, and indigenous Chamorro Samoans and Carolinians live in these areas. Uh, many US federal programs do not fund non-federally recognized tribes, which means many Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. However, the Administration for Native Americans actually does fund all of these populations, and that is a department in uh, HHS. Um, so common terms you'll hear in referring to indigenous peoples, nations, bands, pueblos, tribes, communities, villages, um, all different ways that people talk about themselves, which is, of course, the best uh, word to always use is the word people choose to use themselves. We'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, I just wanna talk briefly about indigenous sovereignty. Um, indigenous people are inherently sovereign. Um, however, in the US, due to a lack of recognition of indigenous sovereignty, we run into this inherent versus practical sovereignty issue where federal Indian statute and case law, the termination era, and plenary power of Congress all limit the practical application of indigenous sovereignty due to lack of recognition by the federal government. There are currently 574 recognized tribes in the US, um, an additional couple hundred state recognized tribes. Um, however, there are many tribes that are still going through the recognition process um, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And there are many tribes who may be federally recognized, but are not recognized by their state. Um, so there's a lot of issues with recognition, uh, respect, and meaningful inclusion of indigenous sovereignty. And this is why it's so important to kind of understand these situations. Um, Native Hawaiians and the Pacific Islander indigenous peoples are not recognized at all. Um, so they're not eligible for a variety of federal dollars funding different programs. Next slide, please. Let's talk briefly about first contact dates in what is now the U.S. and territories. Uh, we have the Doctrine of Discovery coming out of Europe in the late uh, 1400s, which resulted in the uh, movement across the Atlantic 
to North America, Guam, American Samoa, and the Northern Mary Islands, which were all visited in the 1500s and established as the United States and U.S. territories between the 17 and 1900s. Alaska was unique. It was a little, it was actually quite farther north. So not everybody made it that far. Russia actually got to Alaska first. And then Alaska was bought by the U.S. in 1867 and became a territory, but is now a state. Um, in Hawaii, we had uh, James Cook landing on Hawaii first. And then with um, the colonization by American colonists, they actually overthrew the Hawaiian kingdom. Um, and the U.S. just annexed Hawaii regardless of um, the kingdom and their sovereignty in uh, the end of the 1800s. We will go to the next slide, please. So what what did colonization look like? Well, it, it looked like genocide. Um, the estimate is that between 1492, which was the Doctrine of Discovery time period, to now, through all practices of colonization, that there have been the loss of 13 million lives in what is now the U.S. and U.S. territories. Uh, this is a massive scale. I know it is over a large number of years, um, but it's around twice the size of the Holocaust in, um, in Europe during World War II. So it is a big, substantial loss to our languages and to our cultures and, and to our peoples. Um, I want to talk about um, a definition of a genocide that Raphael Lemkin gives. Um, and he points out that genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation, but rather genocide is intended to signify a well-coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of a central foundation of the life of a group. And this is really what we see through federal Indian case law and statutes, that there has really been a systematic and systemic approach to colonization and the resulting genocide. Um, I just have some pictures on here of different uh, situations that happened. We have assimilation on the left with the boarding school area era. Uh, we have enslavement, which is so often not talked about, but was a big part of colonization. We have removal policies, such as the Trail of Tears from Florida to Oklahoma. We have starvation. That top picture is in Alaska. There was um, killing of so many furred sea mammals by the Russians. Um, just wiping out the populations that indigenous people in South Central and South um, West lived on in Alaska. And then the picture below that is a gigantic pile of um, buffalo skulls that the Central um, indigenous people in the Plains area used to live off of. But, you know, the U.S. government, as well as privateers, um, killed off all the, the buffalo just to um, starve the population, not even to use the meat. We have the termination era where the Dawes Act um, just reallocated reservation lands um, and just gave them away to settler populations. Uh, we have acts of involuntary sterilization that happened all the way into the 1970s. And the era we are now in, we are working towards decolonization and land back. We will go to the next slide, please. So all of those colonization events I talked about have led to resulting historical, cultural, and intergenerational trauma. These traumas are emotional and psychological. They attack individual people as well as our communities and societies, um, and they're passed down generationally from one to the next. So in this graphic, you can see on the left side different traumatic events, like with first contact there was disease. Um, after that, you know, was warfare and loss of land. And so those those traumas then feed into what you have in those boxes on the right, which is cumulative stress. So the responses to traumas. So, you know, if you have a, a trauma like a disease or loss of land, then you're going to have stress responses such as unresolved grief. Um, and then this all leads to um, increased uh, unhealthy behaviors of adaptation and reduced uh, health overall, health and well-being overall. Because it's not just talking about physical health, it's talking about mental, um, emotional, uh, community, and individual health. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, so some of the results of colonization, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how they affected communities and then how they affect individuals. So we see a lot of adverse current community conditions coming out of colonization and the resulting historical trauma. I say adverse current community conditions because these are just current. These are not a status that we're stuck with. This is just the situation that some communities are living in. Um, which can be food insecurity and, and insufficient nutrition. This was a big loss when people were moved, you know, hundreds of miles away from where they practiced subsistence. So it was totally new plants and animals to learn to survive off of. Uh, we also have issues of poverty and low educational achievement, overrepresentation in the criminal justice system, um, environment, environmental injustice issues, and then um, issues of the missing and murdered indigenous relatives crisis as well. We'll advance to the next slide, please. So other results, not at the community level, but at individual and family levels, is we see increased prevalence and disparities in mental, physical, and behavioral health, as well as social and relational health. So these might be things as higher youth suicide rates, um, early alcohol, tobacco use, um, higher rates of obesity or diabetes, um, and then other things such as uh, high numbers of adverse childhood experiences. These individual and family well-being challenges are further challenged due to the limited access of health care. I mean, although Indigenous people live both rurally and urban in the U.S., about 70% of Indigenous people are in urban areas, which only 25% of those people have access to IHS facilities in their counties. That's Indian Health Service facilities. So there's, there's some issues with the lack of ability to get to care as well. So although I have presented some deficits, which are issues that our communities are contending with, I really want to focus on the strengths that allow us to draw on culture as a protective and preventative factor to, to address these challenges um, through thousands and thousands of years of built and stored Indigenous knowledge. You can go to the next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about how indigenous cultures can serve as both protective or preventative factors to address colonization and historical trauma. There's a growing body of research as well as common sense in indigenous communities, which will tell you that indigenous knowledge and our cultures are protective. Um, many of the issues I talked about in regards to community issues and family and individual issues did not exist prior to colonization of our people. This immense poverty that we see on reservation land, um, this immense poverty we see in rural Alaska, these were not things that, that were a part of our life. Extremely high suicide rates, that was also, that's not cultural, that's not who we are. Um, and these are really some, some responses that have come to colonization. And so um, when you look at the literature on different types of protective factors, as well as um, what Indigenous people will tell you who have experience in, in their culture and in how it has been protected for them. Um, you'll hear about how enculturation, just knowing about your culture and having a strong Indigenous identity, how protective that is. Um, being involved in traditional activities such as carving canoes or carving totem poles, um, traditional games like the World Eskimo Indian Olympics, uh, having relationships with the land through subsistence um, or traditional food agriculture, social connectedness between families, intergenerations, elders in the community, knowing native languages, and being involved in spirituality and ceremony. These, there are a variety, a large variety of studies that have shown that different aspects of culture that I've listed here um, reduce suicide, improve educational outcomes in youth, reduce truancy, um, reduce fighting and bullying in school, um, that they also um, help, uh, help youth um, graduate high school, um, different things like that. Um, also, they're involved with helping adults stop using substances um, such as alcohol or tobacco. Uh, so there's, there's a whole host of evidence about how protective our cultures are for us. You can go to the next slide, please. So the Indigenous Connectedness Framework is just one example that has come out of 
all this research on culture as a protective factor. Um, Dr. Ulrich, who I gave her guided um, land acknowledgement at the beginning of my presentation, this is something that she's been working on uh, through her dissertation and, and into her assistant professorship as well. Uh, she came together um, with a colleague to put this connectedness framework together. And really what it's showing um, is you see the diagonal factors of community connectedness, environmental connectedness, family connectedness, and intergenerational connectedness. Uh, and she really works with early childhood. So you see the importance of a, child, a child's identity. And so you have all these protective factors, love, ancestral strength, empathy, mentoring, potlatches, um, culture camps, um, indigenous naming ceremonies. You have all these that are protective. From outside of these circles, these, um, these things that are destructive, such as uh, poverty, collective trauma, racism, and suicide. Uh, so, so Dr. Ulrich's work is really looking at how children can have healthy relationships um, to help them not adopt a trauma identity and become healthy adults. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I just want to add a few concluding thoughts to remember with, um, you know, indigenous people are inherently sovereign regardless of how um, the federal or state governments look at it. A colonization is ongoing and the genocide of indigenous people, it also leads to historical trauma, which has those adverse community, individual and family outcomes. However, culture serves as a protective or preventative factor uh, in so many cases, you know, like I said, with substance use, with suicide, um, uh, with criminology, uh, criminal justice issues, with education issues. Um, and so I really want to bring that idea of indigenous well-being through relationality, which is an indigenous understanding that all things are related and through connectedness. Um, I'll give an example of a piece I am working on right now. I had written an academic article about subsistence rights in Alaska and how subsistence rights are important to um, the well-being of indigenous uh, families and children in Alaska. And I am now breaking that down to be a brief that talks about how specifically subsistence cultural practices are protective for youth and families who engage in them. And that, that connection to land, that connection to spirituality um, and relationality between the animals and the plants and the natural environment, as well as the social environment. So really trying to uh, dive into this and, and work on this because it's, it's so important to be healing our communities from these issues that really are ongoing and doing as much as we can, especially for our, our young people. Um, so if you can change the slide, I will just say which is thank you very much in a new Kiptoon. And um, I know it says any questions, but if you can drop any questions in the question thing that Steve mentioned, um, I think we're all gonna take questions at the end, uh, but I welcome you to reach out to me at Child Trends at my email, um, follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or ResearchGate. I'm very happy to have follow-up discussions as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Heather. That was awesome. Um, thank you for providing that essential historical context to the topic. Um, fascinating stuff. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, I think we are going to go, well, we don't want to give short thrift to the, all of the awesome references. Um, I think we're going to go to another poll here. And uh, the poll is, which of the following cultural activities do you think may be able to be used as protective factors against trauma in your community? Uh, with this poll, you can select more than one answer, I believe. So take a look and see which ones resonate with you. Native languages, spirituality and ceremony, traditional activities and games, 
relationships with the land or the ever popular all of the above. And we'll give you a couple more seconds to fill that out. And the ever popular, all of the above wins out again. Um, spirituality and ceremony was the second most popular choice followed by relationships with the land. So a good slate of activities uh, that seem to be resonating with the audience, which is awesome. All right, let's keep things moving. Um, the next presentation, and I will turn it over to Andrea. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, we're going to do a, a pretty big shift um, in um, some of the information that I'll be presenting. Um, you'll see from the slide, um, the topic of my piece is building a trauma-informed temporary assistance for needy families or TANF program. Um, my name is Andrea Hetling. I am a professor at the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I um, wish that was a little shorter sometimes. Um, I've been here for about 15 years now. Um, I My research interests are broadly speaking in sort of public sector um, approaches to um, addressing family issues related to well-being. Um, so I've done work on human services policy, on safety net, intimate partner violence, um, social equity and analysis. Um, my, my motivation um, that brought me into the public policy area um, really stems from work of mine before my PhD program. I worked at a um, as a program administrator at a domestic violence agency in New York City. Um, I thought post college um, as a first generation college graduate that would be my job, right? You finish college, you get a job, um, and I learned so much working at that organization. Um, but the more I learned, the more frustrated I became with um, sort of the struggles and challenges that the families we served were facing. We had immensely talented um, caseworkers and attorneys and child service advocates, um, but the institutional barriers, this was in um, the mid nineties, um, to families in reaching out for help and becoming um, independent regaining their lives and um, they were just met with sort of barriers after barriers and I became very interested in understanding institutions and policy responses um, and how they could better serve families so I went on for my my PhD and my research um, has always focused on different aspects of um, public policy responses um, to better serving families. Um, none of that has intersected um, with work with tribal communities. And I will confess that when um, I first got the email asking of my interest in presenting today, um, my initial reaction was, I, I'm not sure I'm a great match. I, I don't feel like I'm an expert in this area. I am not exactly um, sure kind of how I would fit in. Um, after having conversations with OFA and learning a little bit more about the scope of this and the excellent other presenters that were here, um, I, I began to be convinced that I could fill a, a small um, but hopefully important role. And I am ever so grateful um, for the time to be here with all of you. Um, the your presence, um, I hope that I know, I already have um, had the opportunity to further my own learning, and I'm really hoping we can have um, enough time at the end to have a bit of um, a collaborative conversation and question and answers. Um, so I want to acknowledge that, that my presentation draws on experiences of various um, research projects post um, PhD. Um, most importantly, um, the TANF 
the TANF Trauma-Informed Evaluative Toolkit, um, which was a project I completed a couple of years ago um, in collaboration with OFA, their peer TA project, um, and with the Vermont Department of Children and Families. So a lot of the, the materials I present comes from that work, but also with um, um, from other work that I have done with um, my colleague, Dr. Hilary Botine, um, and other projects focused on both TANF and intimate partner violence um, in Maryland and New Jersey. Um, so next slide, please. Oops, did we miss one slide in between? Yes, a oh, few. Uh, <laughs> I, I realized after seeing Heather's presentation that I, I neglected to put my email address anywhere in my own slides. So I was thinking, oh my goodness, did I neglect this other complete slide? I will add those um, that into the Q&A for everyone later. Um, sorry, I distracted myself. Um, so a trauma-informed approach. Um, the quote that I have here comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It's something that um, I suspect is familiar to many of you um, here today. You know, quickly read um, a program organization or system that is trauma-informed realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands potential paths for recovery recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, families, staff, and others involved with the system, and responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, and seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. Um, Trauma-informed practitioners and researchers often um, refer to this as sort of the four R's, um, and we will sort of um, rely on this as, as our sort of baseline um, foundation um, as we move through the presentation. Um, next slide, please. So my approach to thinking about trauma-informed care relies very much on taking an agency or institutional perspective. Um, there, are, there are multiple um, a, sort of resources out there or other webinars out there that will focus on sort of self-care or how individuals as individuals can sort of approach this topic. Um, I feel strongly based on the work that I've seen, um, the work that others have done that to um, truly incorporate trauma-informed practices um, in a sort of um, responsible and helpful way, um, that it must be this whole holistic systematic approach um, that really is grounded in the institution itself. Um, and that being a trauma-informed agency is a continual process. Um, when I teach at the university and I, I talk to students about these topics, I, it's, this is, being trauma-informed is never a checkbox, right? You can't just be like, oh, and now we are. Um, it is a continual process that requires a commitment of leadership and involvement and engagement with both staff and the families that you serve. Um, integration of a strong trauma-informed lens um, in every aspect of the institution, including policies, practices, and procedures. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, systematic and regular evaluation of what in program evaluation, we also, we often call closing the loop actions. Um, so it's not just enough to kind of think about, um, see where we are and where we aren't trauma-informed and how we can sort of improve, but we really need to then take those next steps and take those actions, close the loop um, and improve. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? Um, it sounds all very sort of almost simple on the surface of it. Um, so with the work that I have done, um, agencies often find it helpful to start with just kind of having so open-ended conversations and reflections um, about how these four R's can really be practically applied. Um, to the agency, to the institution. And we think about these four R's, um, how well in our policies, practices, and procedures um, 
do documents actually contain this language? It's not just an assumption, but it's actually part um, of, of written documents. Um, do those documents contain language that recognizes and addresses trauma? Um, and we'll, in a few minutes, talk about these six key principles of a trauma-informed approach. Um, so we'll get us a little bit down to even more tangible aspects of this. Um, conversations, you know, at the outset of just understanding or recognizing how well or, or poorly, frankly, do some policies perhaps match these principles? Um, what are place where are some areas that we can improve? And again, what steps can be taken? Um, sometimes small and sometimes big, um, sometimes short term or long term. But thinking of these as action items um, after that initial conversation. Next slide, please. So these six key principles um, that the, also goes back to the work that the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has done. Um, in addition to these four R's, they emphasize six principles, safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and finally, cultural, historical and gender issues. The age, Sam said, defines all of these. And as I was working in Vermont and we were discussing sort of how these intersect with TANF agencies, um, we started refining some of the definitions a little bit. Um, some of them are more obvious than others. Um, safety, referring to both physical and psychological and emotional safety, um, reflective of some of um, Heather's presentation. When we think about a principle or a foundational principle of trustworthiness and transparency in a TANF office, um, we can think about how operations and decisions are communicated, are made with transparency um, and with the goal of, of establishing trust. Peer support, um, this is one that, that we all, that in our conversations, um, we found, or caseworkers sometimes found challenging because there's often not opportunities for families to connect with each other. Um, and we discussed quite a bit sort of offering the space, but not requiring. Um, it's possible to sort of have physical spaces that allow for interactions a little bit easier um, than others or to establish groups um, but not require those groups, um, which will get into our fifth principle a little bit. Um, collab fourth first though, um, collaboration and mutuality. We can think about um, partnering um, both among staff and between staff and our families, um, leveling those power differentials. Um, I think for me, one of the um, kind of aspects to make this a little bit more concrete, I, I like to kind of apply these to different aspects of an agency, right? And one of the um, things that I've thought about a lot being at a school of planning, urban planning and public policy um, is space, is the is physical space. Um, when we think about leveling power differentials, when we think about establishing trust, um, meeting spaces that, that could include not just a traditional desk and the person you're serving across the desk, um, maybe a table, or at the very least, if that's not possible in the space, um, not having a desk that someone's kind of behind piles of papers, um, which could send a message of, well, I have other things that I'm working on here. Um, being able to be very cognizant of the parameters of space and the messages that we're sending through those um, physical characteristics. Empowerment, voice, and choice is also something that um, oftentimes 
and we'll talk in a little bit about um, the TANF program. Um, there are requirements that families have to follow. Um, there's not sort of open choice with everything, but there are ways in incorporating. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that when um, Crystal presents, she'll also have other ideas and I will learn from her um, some more of the on the ground movement um, in um, case management practices that include client voice um, better than some more traditional approaches. Finally, cultural, historical, and gender issues. Um, agencies need to confront any biases and also incorporate those protective, protective factors um, that Heather was talking about earlier in particular. And when we think about how each of these principles are defined and operationalized in specific contexts, um, in case management, in physical space, in interactions, um, in staff trainings, um, we want to make sure that we are defining those principles and also as we're evaluating ourselves and being um, in a healthy way, critical of operations and policies, um, that we're actually collecting relevant data. And when I often talk about data, um, individuals go to numbers right away, right? How many, how much? Um, but I'm speaking more broadly about um, both qualitative and quantitative, quantitative and qualitative data. Um, so if, um, one example, um, a little bit more close to home, I live in a very urban area in central New Jersey. There's been lots of conversations about um, having uh, metal detectors in um, offices before clients come in. Oftentimes those metal detectors um, have been implemented under the assumption that that would make people feel safer. Um, if we want to actually know whether those policies or practices are making people feel safer, we need to ask people. Uh, we need to collect the relevant data um, and we need to be open-minded enough to then listen to those data, um, systematically analyze those data and be willing to make changes. Um, there was a lot of assumptions again that that would make people feel safer um, and conversations with families, um, the, the clear finding for some individuals, not all, was that those, that practice of a metal detector made them feel more violated, not, not safer. Um, so being able to listen um, and collect the relevant and appropriate data to answer those questions. Next uh, slide, please. When I talk about an institutional or agency approach, um, at the end of the day, it's those systems that need to get changed, but systems can't change themselves. Um, they can't be proactive. Um, they can't result in the changes that we wanna see. So all of this falls on humans as we are the ones that can make change. Um, and this often falls on agency staff. Staff trainings on, on Self-care on secondary trauma um, are incredibly important, um, but I work ha research has shown that making that an individual responsibility um, can oftentimes add to stress and not take away stress. Um, building resilience and addressing secondary traumatic staff, stress among staff um, really is an organizational responsibility, um, creating those structures that provide supportive supervision, um, uh, checking in with staff, um, providing those trainings, um, implementing trauma-informed principles across the agency will also help staff do their job um, in a um, more productive um, way. All of these are agency responsibilities. Um, and I also like to recognize the really important role supervisors play in supporting their staff, um, modeling self-care behaviors, and really reaching out and creating a relationship with staff where your staff can speak with you. Um, you can then advocate for their needs. Next slide, please. 
So what is all of this mean for TANF agencies? I, I'm hoping all of you can tell me a little bit more, um, but I wanna acknowledge that the challenges are real, right? Um, we can have checklists, we can have conversations, we can go through these activities, but um, the block grant structure, time limits, participation requirements, all of these um, make constraints um, on you, on your staff, um, on your families and working within constraints can be challenging, um, but opportunities do exist. And I am really excited by some of the changes in case management approaches that are based more on strengths-based or goal-oriented um, two-generation approaches that, that recognize the protective factors that do exist among families and supports those and supports client empowerment um, and voice and agency among the families that that we serve, um, good cause waivers, collaborations with other community organizations, um, kind of creative approaches in, in thinking out of the box a little bit. Um, and I would be remiss not to acknowledge that sometimes closing the loop activities um, or the power to do that doesn't rest within um, a county agency, a state agency, a tribal agency. Um, Sometimes change is necessary at the federal level and closing the loop might just be communicating that um, to a federal level um, and recognizing that we need to kind of push on another level um, that not all of the work can be done at home. Next slide, please. So some key takeaways from my um, perspective. Again, this is a continual process. Um, we're all learning all of the time and, and being reflective and approaching this um, in trying to improve over time. And, and, you know, it's the, you learn more and you can do things better. Um, supporting resilience um, and those protective factors among families leads to well being and growth. Um, it, research supports this, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, addressing secondary traumatic trauma, uh, sorry, addressing secondary trauma among staff is an organizational responsibility. It is not enough to tell um, staff to practice self-care, um, giving them the space and the ability, the supervisor's um, structure that addresses that is necessary. Um, and for all of you, there's tons of um, resources and supports available. I, I applaud OFA for organizing this um, webinar today. Next slide, please. Um, this is the, the toolkit that I referenced that was made in collaboration with um, Vermont. I feel with all knowledge, it's bounded by, you know, the experiences we build on. So this is um, already feeling a little dated. Um, this was done pre-pandemic and, you know, a lot of practices have, have changed um, virtual and otherwise um, pandemic. And again, this was developed in conjunction um, with Vermont, which has, you um, a population that may look or does look different from other places. Um, so it's very much rooted in their culture and experiences, the examples in the in the toolkit. I'm, I'm hoping that they translate well to other areas, but I, I'm re really, really um, curious to hear others' experiences. Next slide, please. A few other resources. Again, I apologize for not putting my email on there as well. It's just ahetling at rutgers.edu. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, I look forward to our Q&A um, and I will end it here. Thanks, Andrea. My, my fellow Central New Jerseyan, um, we appreciate having you here. That that was awesome information. I really like the key principles and the idea of reimagining meeting space and my favorite kind of data, which is qualitative. Um, usually when you hear data, sometimes eyes gloss over. I might be speaking of myself, but I think other people also. But just talking to people and listening can, can give you great data. So uh, awesome to, to hear, to have you present that. Okay, another poll before our, our next exciting speaker. What are some ways your tribal TANF program may already be implementing trauma-informed practices? Uh, and again, this is a multiple choice poll, so you can choose as many answers as you would like. 
uh, awareness of culture and the importance of incorporating this awareness in daily practice and organizational operations, diversity and inclusion training for staff, staff training on ethics, boundaries, and expected behavior, privacy and confidentiality, and others, which you can also indicate in the chat or Q&A. Uh, and we will give you a couple more seconds before we share those results. Okay, so it looks like awareness of culture and the importance of incorporating this awareness in daily practice and organizational operations is the most popular uh, implementation that's already occurring, but there are some good numbers for all of these options. So I think it's good to see that, that agencies are already putting some of these practices, um, are already incorporating some of these practices. All right, let's go on to our next speaker who I think can give us some more insight on implementing these practices. Uh, oh, sorry, one more poll before we, I was, I was so excited about the next speaker that I forgot, one more. Um, what else might, might you like to hear about regarding building a trauma-informed tribal TANF program? Are there other aspects that you'd like to hear about? Uh, other ideas that you would like to see further developed, uh, let us know. You can type answers in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, and we will certainly see if we can get our presenters to respond or see if we can produce a follow-up uh, webinar. Uh, I think we also have the link for the, evalu the evalu evaluative toolkit, the, uh, Andrea referenced earlier. I'll see if I can get somebody to pop that into the chat for you as well. It's on the Peer TA website with a, a number of other uh, resources that we uh, are posted and are, are now developing related to trauma-informed practices. So keep your eyes peeled for that. All right, now the next speaker uh, can begin and we are excited to have her as well. Um, so I will turn it over to Crystal. So we're going to talk about trauma care, trauma-informed care in practice. Um, next slide. My name is Crystal Christensen. Um, I'm from Metlakatla, Alaska, but I have been in Juneau, Alaska for 14 years now. I'm Dag Hitan at the Baskin. Um, I have nine years of experience in tribal social services from general assistance, TANF, voc rehab, ICWA, um, parent education, parent education, and I am currently the family preservation coordinator at Clinkett High Central Council Clinkett and Haida Tribal Family and Youth Services. Um, my job entails working closely um, tribal TANF. Um, child welfare with tribal TANF, um, and we provide prevention services to um, families that are on TANF. Um, so the the risk of their children being removed by um, child protective protective services is lowered. Um, next slide, please. So. Um, Understanding the effects of trauma. What does trauma do to um, to people? What did, how does it affect us um, physically and mentally? Um, for one, it impairs memory, thinking, learning, concentration, and adaptability. It impacts ability to trust, cope, and form healthy relationships. It disrupts emotional regulation and expression. expression um, shapes beliefs about self and others, hope and life outlook. And it's also linked to chronic illness and substance use disorders. Next slide, please. Um, these are the key principles of trauma-informed care. When I was doing my research, I found several um, 
several sites that listed five. I've set, found several sites that listed more than six. These are the SAMHSA, these are taken from the SAMHSA, SAMHSA website, um, and they, inf they identify the key principles of trauma as safety, trustworthy and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, um, cultural, historical and gender, gender issues. So um, so by by addressing these these six um, principles is how we really um, implement trauma informed care. Next slide, please. So implementing trauma-informed care principles, and we know what they are, so how do we implement them? Next slide, please. Um, for the first one, creating a safe and welcoming environment. Um, what does that mean? It means having a physical environment that is safe and welcoming by having well-lit common areas, monitoring who's coming and going from the buildings, um, keeping noise levels at a minimum. Um, and ensuring all work areas are well kept, um, positive messaging. So um, also the social emotional environment, all staff are courteous and respectful, um, maintaining clear communication and expectations, and all staff are trained in trauma-informed practices. Next, next slide, please. Um, building trustworthiness and transparency. So when clients come to us, they usually have experienced great trauma and it tend to have trust issues. So how do we combat that? How do we help them and make them more susceptible to accepting the help that they're that we're we're um giving. Um, so we want to ensure that families know their rights and responsibilities. Our TANF program has in the, in the application packet has um, the rights and responsibilities um, right there for TANF families, um, for families when they're filling out the application. Um, we want to be clear, consistent, and dependable. Um, a lot of trauma comes from not being able to count on others. So we want to make sure that we're not re-traumatizing our clients by being clear, consistent, and dependable. Um, also, we want to acknowledge achievements, however small they may be. They may seem small to us, but to our, our families that we serve, they may be a very, um, a very big deal, something that they may have never achieved before. And we want to make sure we acknowledge all of those achievements um, whenever we can. Um, and then also establish and maintain appropriate boundaries. Um, that it's very important, um, especially if you're living in a smaller community, um, that that your your families know, hey, you know, this is okay and this is not okay. But but really keep those boundaries. If you have families that are trying to get a hold of you after hours, um, it it is okay to step in and and set those boundaries. Um, okay, thank you. Next slide. Um, recognizing the benefits of peer support. Um, we always encourage community engagement by offering groups and activities that promote peer interaction. We have parenting groups, we have um, women's support groups, we have um, groups that focus on um, sobriety um, and really getting our clients and our families involved with these peer support groups um, is very beneficial. A lot of times families come to us and because of the trauma they have experienced, um, they're very closed off and they tend to tend to stay within themselves and they don't really have that peer support. Um, but for us to offer these groups, it provides an opportunity for our clients to to meet other people maybe in the same situation and start rebuilding those peer support relationships. Um, also, um, knowing and utilizing community resources. Um, as part of our 
what we call TTCW, which stands for Tribal TANF Child Welfare Team. Um, we have weekly meetings um, every week. We have a meeting where we all come together. We talk about mutual clients. We talk about topics of interest. And once a month, um, what we do is we invite community organizations to speak at our at our meetings, at our TTCW weekly meetings. Um, so we get familiar with the organization. Um, we get familiar with the services that are offered through the organization. And then we are familiarized with the staff at these different organizations. Um, and it really, um, we really like to utilize what a warm handoff, um, knowing it's, Sometimes our families have a hard time going in and asking for help. Um, and we recognize that sometimes it's not enough just to tell them, hey, go to this place, here's their number. Um, we really want to get in the door, introduce them to the services, introduce them to the people in the, the um, organization that we are referring them to. And, you know, if we can do it in person, that is that is the um that is preferred um i realize not not everybody is able to do everything in person these days um i always call um covid the pandemic blessing in disguise because we found hey we don't really need to do everything in person if we absolutely can't we can do video conferencing we can do you know we've really learned how to do all of these things so in person is preferred um, if not, video conferencing would be next, and then a three-way call. But we don't want to. We're we're trying to move away from the what I would consider like a cold referral. We're trying to move away from that, and and that way our families are more likely to follow up and follow through with these referrals that are being made. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this brings us to um, collaboration and mutuality. Um, we want to emphasize equality. We are not there as authority figures to our families. Um, we are right there with them, helping them. Um, but we want to make sure that we are we are equal. We're not better than them. We're not worse than them. So we want to make sure that that we're equal. Um, also, we want to share in decision-making responsibilities. Um, we don't wanna make all these decisions and tell our families that, hey, you have to go do this. We want them to be involved with that process. Um, vocational re rehabilitation um, has what they call informed choice. So you get, um, you explain all of the options that our clients have and let them be the ones to make the major decisions. It is their life um, and they know better, um, you know, they know themselves better uh, than, than we do. So we really want to make them or get them to share those decision-making responsibilities. Um, also assessing, assessing family strengths and needs. Um, in our uh, Preserving Native Families program, our prevent child welfare prevention program, um, we have what we call a family strengths and needs assessments. Um, and so when we assess a family's strengths and needs, we, we recognize what their strengths are. We, we identify areas that need improvement and we use those strengths to, um, to build on the areas where they may need help. So we, we are using their strengths to build up their needs um, to build up the areas where they, they may have needs. Um, and then utilizing warm handoffs. We definitely, you know, that that is the way to go is to utilize those warm handoffs. Um, and you know, clients will have a, a better follow through. It's a more personalized experience. Okay, thank you. Next slide. 
Um, we also want to empower families. Um, how do we do this? We provide options. We don't just tell them, oh, here's this, go do this. We, we give them options and we give them choices. Um, also, we, we build on those strengths, um, build off of those strengths um, and, and use that to, um, to enhance other parts of their life that may be lacking. Um, also, we model and support. It is very important for us um, to model the behaviors that we want to see. Um, if if we, you know, we we really just need to model um, the behaviors we want to see. A lot of times, our families have not seen that modeled before, um, and they they really look to us. And then we also want to support them when they are trying to change their behaviors, um, and and trying to um, to do what we are modeling for them. And then also we want to encourage self efficacy um, because we don't plan on being in their lives for. Um, an extended period of time, we want them to be able to feel confident enough um, so that when we are, when we finally step out of the picture, that they are able to carry on, that we've given them the tools that they need to feel confident and capable to carry on in the same way without us there. Okay. Thank you, next slide. Um, cultural awareness. We have to understand that cultural factors um, influence responses to traumatic experiences, impact a person's willingness to seek help, and it also shapes their communication style. Um, during one of our, our meetings, our TTCW meetings, one of our um, team members re recalled a, recalled a, um, an incident when she was helping at the homeless shelter. Um, they were serving, they cooked and served a meal at the local homeless shelter. And it, she had gotten, um, she she had a had an experience where one of the um the people that she was serving was starting to get irate with her um and just making her feel uncomfortable. Um and she reflecting on that she felt that you know at the in the in the heat of the moment i wasn't really thinking but now that i look back on it that's probably you know they probably communicate in that way because that's what's helped them in the past that's something that has helped them in the past we also want to encourage cultural connection to promote healing and well-being being connected to one's culture and knowing who they are is a very, um, it's it's very very powerful. So any chance we get, we like to um, have our families engage in cultural activities. You know, for the kids, we have dance groups. Um, there have been regalia making and beading circles that have been offered anything to really bring our people back to our ways of life um, is, is, is very helpful in, in, in being a trauma informed, um, trauma informed organization, um, really recognizing that that's where we should be moving our, our people back to. And then we also have to recognize, understand and address historical trauma. Um, it is there. It's not going, you know, it's 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 here and it is an issue that we do have to deal with um, and really understanding the importance of what role that may play in our families' lives is very important. Um, next slide. Uh, virtual trauma-informed care. So back to the pandemic, um, when we went home, um, we were lucky to when we got sent home for the lockdown we were we were fortunate that um we were still allowed and able to do our jobs from home um so how did we adapt trauma informed care during the pandemic um it's tricky to do in person and it can be even trickier to do um virtually so um i 
during the first part of the pandemic, I, I ran a parenting parenting education group. Um, and this is what I found to be particularly helpful. Um, active listening, whether it be over Zoom, um, whether it be on the phone, it was easier to do on Zoom. If you're on Zoom, make sure you have your video on. Um, it's it's really hard for people to relate to a blank screen or maybe just a picture of you. So um, active listening is really important. Um, video chatting helped it, um, helps make it a little bit easier to, so people know that you're there. Um, also frequent contact, you know, texting, um, calling a bit more frequently than, than you would, would have in, um, in, if you were meeting them in person, say once a week, you know, a couple times a week, you know, really checking in with them um, because being locked down and being secluded was was very difficult for a lot of people. So really keeping in contact um, with our, our families. Um, also using video conferencing um, anytime you can um, during during the pandemic is is a lot. Um, I think it was helpful that virtual contact was was helpful to know help people know that they were not alone. Um, ensuring privacy and confidentiality, uh, making sure you're in a room, you know, working from home, that you have a designated area and that people do not um, disturb your area, um, and making sure that it is private and confidential um, to keep. Um, to keep that trust. Um, also emotional responsiveness. Um, you know, being being aware of of what what people may have been feeling, um, just being emotionally responsive. Um, I like emojis. I really, really enjoy using emojis when I text. My kids say um, I use them too much. But I was like, I was very excited when emojis first came out because I'm like, because I could think, hey, I can I can do this text message um, and put a little smiley face or a frowny face. So it was really nice to know um, that I could convey my emotions and my emotional responsive responsiveness with the use of emojis. Sometimes that's what we have to do, um, because if if you're sending a text message or even an email um, people really don't get your tone. Um, and so it, it's kind of nice to have those, those aids available if you choose to use them. Um, and then also minimizing distractions. Um, just, you know, going back to the uh, privacy and confidentiality portion, make sure you're in a place where, you know, when you're on a video conference or a telephone call with, with a family, um, or someone, one of your clients, um, to make sure that you're in a quiet place and you're not going to be distracted by people coming and going from your area. Um, okay, thank you. Next slide. Um, so how do we improve trauma-informed response? Um, one, provide regular staff training. Um, and when we talk about staff training, we're talking about everybody in the office from the administrators to the front desk staff to the support staff everybody, and everybody in between um, because trauma-informed in care is everybody's responsibility in our organizations. We really want to make sure that everybody that our clients, our families are going to encounter um, are going to be well-trained in trauma-informed care. And it will even it will create an even um, a safer environment where people feel comfortable and will um, be able to come to us during um, and and feel safe where they're not going to be re-traumatized. Um, also, use a holistic approach. Um, approach people as a whole and not just try to treat you know certain symptoms. We want to make sure we use a holistic approach. Um, also. Recognizing triggers. When we get to know our families, we get to know our clients, um, we can figure out what, what may trigger them. Um, some people may startle from loud noises, so we want to take extra precaution to 
avoid anything that can do that, you know, that's within our power and our um, control. Um, but we really want to start being able to recognize the triggers of our families and tr taking steps to avoid them. Um, we also want to use appropriate language. Um, and it, yeah, just using appropriate language. We don't want to escalate when our clients may start escalating. Um, we want to make sure everything is clear um, and understandable for our clients as well. Um, also reframing our behavior, just as in the example, as I said before, um, about the the um, person coming up to one of our team members when she was serving at the glory hall, um, we have to recognize that a lot of behavior that people who have experienced trauma um, have has been developed in response to this trauma. And at the time, that behavior may have helped them get through the situation, but we have to help them we have to understand first we have to understand that that this they're not really meaning for this behavior to happen um and we have to understand that it it's helped them through a really difficult time and we and then when we reframe that behavior and we can see things in a different light um we can then help them take steps to start working on changing that behavior, um, giving them that sense of security that, hey, you know, this this may have worked in the past, but we don't need to take it, take it into the future. Um, and then also practice empathy. Um, really try to put yourself in the shoes, in, in your client's shoes to see things from their point of view. Um, and practice empathy. And then also take time to reflect. Um, reflection is a powerful tool. When we take time to reflect on, on certain situations, um, we can always go back and say, what, what could I have done better? Or what worked in the situation that I can take into another si similar situation? Um, but really taking time to reflect um is is very important um okay thank you next slide okay that's it thank you so much and i want to ask some questions that we have here for our first two speakers if heather and andrea are available um let's see what's coming in as always folks you can answer enter questions in the q a portion whenever you uh whenever you wish so let's see for heather um there's a question how do adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress manifest in our communities and can culture be used to address these effects Yeah, absolutely. So um, that toxic stress and those adverse conditions um, due to toxic stress, due to historical trauma, uh, manifest in our communities in so many different ways. Some of the ways I talked about were how we have, um, there's issues with poverty, there's issues of people having mental and physical health issues that might prevent them from working a full-time job. Um, there's we uh, indigenous communities in the U.S. have extremely low graduation rates. Although we are 2.9% of the population in the U.S., we are only 0.7% of the earned bachelor's degrees. So there's a lot of situations that due to the trauma um, and due to the high ACEs scores, which um, a lot of the uh, personal and family issues I talked about regarding trauma really feed into those ACEs scores. Um, being um, that there might be um, issues of violence in the home, issues of um, issues around poverty, issues around divorce, or um, uh, children um, being exposed to to certain conditions. Um, there's a variety of things resulting from colonization directly 
that can have violence in the community or that can have family members in the criminal justice system. And all these things do feed into ACEs and increased levels of stress. And so it's been shown that culture, so when I talk about culture as a protective or preventative factor, I'm not talking about a culturally adapted Western intervention. So I'm not talking about a culturally adapted activity. I'm talking about a culturally grounded activity. So if I want to address, so I used to work for the administration for Native Americans, and we funded a lot of work based around culture. And so, for example, if a community was having issues with youth having low grades, dropping out of school, um, and using substances, uh, a grant that might be applied for was to teach youth to carve a traditional canoe and go on a sailing voyage. Now, never in their grant are they going to talk about educational achievement? Are they going to talk about suicide? Are they going to address those things directly? Instead, it's the true ability for culture to be protective, just being grounded in their indigenous identity, having those connections to their community, learning from elders about, um, about carving and about traditional voyaging. That, that would be in the Pacific or even Southeast Alaska, the Shinkit people also do canoe voyaging. Um, you know, having these, these grounding things that, that connect you to who you are and, and to your family and community, to the land, and to your culture and language are just found to have a direct um, impact on well-being in, in such a variety of ways, um, all the way from suicide rates, improved self-esteem, uh, dropout rates, um, issues of bullying, um, substance abuse issues, um, and even uh, things um, even elders being involved in culture as a protective factor is, is helping to heal uh, some of the damages of boarding school attendance as well. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Heather. That's, that's so good. Grounded is such a, a key word. It's, it's, it's like that foundation that you have to build. You, you can build a strong building to withstand anything on the strong foundation if you're grounded. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks for hanging in there with us and, and thanks for the work that you are doing with families. Um, that's awesome stuff. So I mentioned earlier that I had a question for, for Andrea and then uh, I think there's a question that's coming for Crystal as well. So we'll circle back to you in a second. Um, Andrea, there's a question about Tribal TANF program managers, supervisors, how can they incorporate trauma-informed practices for their staff um, in, in their office habits and to, to help promote resiliency? That's that's a hard, a hard job. It's we have to look out for our staff because of all the people they're looking out for. Um, are there some practices that that program managers can use to, to promote those practices? It's a great question, Steve. And I think that a lot of um, what Crystal was just sort of presenting on her last slide, like also, you know, it it relates to human interactions, right? And as um, supervisors, remembering that our staff are human, um, just like our, our families are, um, and practicing trauma-informed behaviors with our staff that are going through a lot. And I think one of my, you know, we think about active listening, we think about doing their, I think principles related to active supervision are so important in this context. It's, it's not just enough to tell your staff, well, you can come to me anytime, um, and putting the responsibility on them. Um, instead, checking in on on your staff, um, not just opening your door, but going down to their door and, and checking in and having those regular meetings. Um, it's, it's more than just being available. It's, it's really being active and, and being there for your staff and, and listening to them as well. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Crystal, with, with all of the work that you're doing, um, did you partner with with other organizations, other offices, um, 
to to best support your clients in 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 the journeys that they're undertaking yes we we have had um so we have have monthly orientations um we've partnered i think we've had six monthly orientations so far um with six separate agencies outside of um outside of uh, child welfare and tanf um and we we plan on continuing those um you know one of ours one of our recent ones was the adult learning center um some of our clients come to us with without a ged or high school diploma so you know we we are um recognizing organizations that will be beneficial to our clients um and you know getting familiar learning about all of their programs you know it our resources are not static organizations change new services are offered services are taken away but really establishing those relationships learning what what is being offered um and getting our name out there in the community um it, it really it is really helpful. We've even um, had an orientation with our um, police department. We've had a, a lieutenant come in and talk to us um, and trying to figure out how we can support those people that the police that police officers may have contact with. Um, they they have agreed to hand out brochures to families that they feel may need may be may need our services. So we are definitely trying to partner with as many community organizations um, as well as our internal organizations. Thank you, fantastic. All right, folks, we are just about out of time. Um, so I wanna thank our esteemed panel of speakers. Uh, they all did a wonderful job and I'm going to turn it over to another esteemed speaker, James Butler, to help close us out. Thanks, Steve, and, and thanks to all the Bible presenters. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining the webinar today. Um, just as another reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be available shortly on the OFA PRTA website at the link that you see on the screen before you, which is PRTA.ACF.HHS.gov. Um, the PRTA website offers access to information on programs and policies covering topics including human services, child welfare, workforce development, family strengthening, and asset building. Um, also, um, you, you can sign up for the newsletters um, by registering on the OFA sponsored webinars and request technical assistance, ask questions of one's peers, or find some professional development opportunities. Um, you can also help us uh, expand our network and reach a greater number of people by directing interested colleagues um, from your local state and tribal networks and agencies to the PRTA website. Um, we would also like to hear from you about any future webinar topics that you may have in mind. And you can send those to the second link that's before you, which is PRTA at blhtech.com. Thanks again to everyone who participated in today's webinar. And thanks again to our expert presenters. Um, at the, as the webinar closes, we're gonna launch a quick survey for you to complete regarding today's webinar. And that will appear um, in a separate pop-up window when the webinar ends. Um, as always, your feedback is very important to us and it helps us to inform future webinars. So thanks again for your time today. Um, we look forward to your participation in future webinars. Everybody have a great remainder of your day.